Hey guys, I just wanted to give you a quick illustration as to why we have the ambiguous case for the law of sines. You may remember from geometry that there's one congruency property that does not work all the time, which is your side-side angle case. Uh, that's not a congruency theorem, and uh, so if I'm given that situation in a triangle, I need to be careful because there's actually a potential for two solutions. And those two solutions would look uh, I can would look like um, two completely different triangles. One would look uh, sort of like this, sort of like an acute triangle here, and then another one would be a rather obtuse triangle, something similar like that. And the reason how this one is formed is this opposite side doesn't necessarily have to go right there to make an acute angle, I could actually place it right there so that this is the still the same length but now it makes a completely different triangle. So there's actually two solutions. This is supported uh, with our sine function. So if I'm looking for an angle right here, I would set it up using my law of sines as the sine of, uh, let's call this angle B. So the sine of B over this adjacent side, labeled here, that's going to equal the sine of A over the opposite side. And I'll multiply, so this is the situation, that adjacent side times the sine of A over the opposite side. Now if I'm going to find angle B, I have to do an inverse of all of this. Okay. Well, you may remember from uh, our unit circle, when I have to inverse sine, there's uh, two ang two answers. You know, one of them is in the domain for the inverse, but there's actually two potential solutions from based off of our unit circle. Uh, sine is positive in the first quadrant but it's also positive in the second quadrant and so uh, so these two angles theta and what we'll call theta 2 can have the actual same value for sine uh, so these two angles represent my two solutions the relationship between these two angles and between B1 and B2 is really that the, they are supplementary. Uh, notice this isosceles triangle right here. Uh, so if this is B1, this is also B1 over here, and uh, this B2 becomes my second possible answer. And I would find B2 by taking 180 degrees and subtracting B1. That will give me my second answer. So here's a, uh, here's a situation that I've, I've uh, come up with. Uh, my angle, given angle is 40, the opposite side is 10, and the adjacent side is 14. And I'm pretty sure I can have two solutions. Uh, but just to make sure, uh, we can think uh, if that side is able to move over the side of 10 is able to actually be placed on the inside of the triangle and a test for that is to just look to see if the opposite side is less than the adjacent side and if that's the case there is a possible two solutions two solutions so I'm going to go through and, and set this up so the sine of B over 14 is going to equal the sine of 40 over 10. After some cross multiplying and dividing, I get 14 sine of 40 over 10. And so angle B, once I inverse that, sine of 40 
over 10 equals 64.1 degrees. OK, so this is 64.1 degrees. Uh, that would make this angle over here 64.1 degrees. And that second solution for angle B would then be, uh, angle B2 would be 180 minus 64.1 degrees, which is 115.9. Angle B2 is 115.9 degrees. So there's my second solution. Now, to finish this up, I'll actually need to go ahead and, and find angle C up here, subtracting these two from 180, and do it again and find C2 subtracting these two from uh, 180, this 115.9, and I get my two solutions. So it's best to, when you have that side-side angle case, to actually draw your two triangles just like that, and, and then you are reminded to solve this problem twice. Thanks for tuning in.